Here. And you, you 
you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. The man continued, then, then Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. And Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, no, Father Abraham, but if, if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Talk about a little foreshadowing of what's to come later with Jesus. And may God bless to our hearing and our understanding these words from our scripture for today. And would you pray with me? Most loving and most gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So a gentleman by the name of Ron Wayne, um, as far as I know, no relation to the Duke, was one of the founders of Apple, along with Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. And he helped to steer the computer company in its, in its early days, and even had a hand in designing the, the famous Apple logo, I understand. Wayne owned but 10% of the company, while Jobs and Wozniak each own 45%. But Wayne, he decided to hand back his stake, fearing that he might be liable for a portion of a $15,000 loan that they took out if the company went under. Of course, as we all know, Apple succeeded. And if Wayne had held on to his 10% stake, it would now be worth about $200 billion. Only 15%. That's only 10%. 10%. Right, right now, Apple is guessed to be worth $2 trillion. Uh, so does, does Wayne say he has any regrets? Surprisingly, no. I made my decision on the information I had at the time, he says. I've got my health, my family, and integrity, and that is the best fortune you could ask for. Do we believe him? I mean, come on. $200 billion and no regrets? Well, as we just heard, Jesus tells the story of a rich man who was as he puts it, dressed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. The man dies, is buried, and finds himself in Hades being tormented. Does he have any regrets? Well, Jesus implies that he does, uh, but none of his regrets involve poor business decisions or, or missed opportunities to make money. He does not say, I should have held on to my 10% stake in that apple orchard. No. The rich man's regrets seem to go in a different direction, uh, one that matches the trend we are seeing today in society. A nurse specializing in care of the terminally ill has recorded the most common regrets of the dying. And you know what? There's no mention of missed business deals, no regrets about skip bungee jumping opportunities, or, or, or even about marriage, uh, despite the many jokes that link regret to the choice of a mate. For instance, a woman inserts an ad in the classifieds, husband wanted. Next day she receives a hundred letters, they all say the same thing, you can have mine. <laughs> No. The, the top five regrets 
discovered by the nurse include, fifth, I wish I had let myself be happier. People admit that they feared change in their lives, so they, they pretended that they were content. In fact, they wish they had laughed more and allowed themselves to just be sillier. Fourth, I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. People felt badly that they were so caught up in their own lives that they let important friendships slip away. Third, I wish I'd had the courage to express my true feelings. Many people suppress their feelings in order to keep peace with others. Second, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. This regret was expressed by every, every male patient, every single one. And then the number one big regret discovered by our nurse friend, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. That was the most common regret of all expressed. Most people had not honored even a half of their dreams, says our nurse friend, and had to die knowing that it was due to choices they had made or not made. Hmm. So do any of these regrets ring true? What would you regret if this were your last day on earth? You know, Jesus suggests to us that the rich man was not alone in his life and his death. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus. Oh, he was covered with sores and just longed to satisfy his hunger with what might fall from the rich man's table. Lazarus? Oh, well, even he may have had some regrets. But they probably did not include number five, I wish I had let myself be happier. The life of Lazarus was, in the words of philosopher Thomas Hobbes, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. For Lazarus, happiness was not a choice. It was a scrap from the rich man's table, which we're told never came. And Jesus tells us that the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. And that the rich man also died and was buried, and there, in Hades, we begin to get a sense of the rich man's regrets. Regret number one. I wish that I had cared for the people around me. The poor man Lazarus was lying at his gate, covered with sores, and well, evidently the rich man just stepped over and around him each time he left home. Every single day, the rich man missed a chance to help Lazarus by simply giving him the leftovers from his table. Possible regret number two. I wish that I had listened to Moses and the prophets. The rich man comes to realize in death that he had not paid attention to the word of God as it came through Moses. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, it says in Leviticus. He had not heeded the prophet Isaiah, who commanded, share your bread with the hungry, bring the homeless poor into your house. Regret number three. I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself and not the life others expected of me. I've already said, every day the rich man evidently just ignored poor Lazarus, fully aware of the teachings of Moses and the prophets, but he didn't have the courage to live a life of integrity, one in which his actions were in line with what he observed and what he believed. In Hades, the rich man feels a big regret. 
Uh, and he says to Abraham, I beg you, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers that, that he may warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. I mean, the rich man cares deeply for his brothers. He, he's not a man without feelings. But Abraham replies, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. Yes, that's right, the rich man realizes. But Moses and the prophets, well, they weren't enough for him. No, Father Abraham, he pleads. If someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Surely it will turn their lives around if dead Lazarus comes back to life and warns them. And shaking his head, Abraham says, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be convinced even if someone should rise from the dead. Abraham was talking to the rich man. I think he's also talking to us, right along with the rich man and his brothers. And the question is, are we convinced? Are we persuaded to change our ways if someone actually rises from the dead as Christians. Now, let's be clear. None of us are perfect. And we will all come to the end of life feeling that we've made some mistakes along the way. There are choices we'll feel badly about alongside opportunities we wish we had seized. But what would it mean for us to die with no big regrets. I think the top regrets of the, the rich man can teach us the lesson that we, like five brothers, may need to learn. My guess is we don't want to arrive at the pearly gate saying, I wish I'd cared for the people around me. I wish that I'd listened to Moses, the prophets, and Jesus. I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself in which my actions were in line with my beliefs. We are not yet in the afterlife, calling out to Father Abraham. We're not stuck in a place of regretting that we didn't do enough, that, that we could have done more, that, that we didn't choose wisely, that we just didn't have enough time. As long as we are breathing, we can choose to care for the people around us, listen to the teaching of our faith, and live a life that is true to our deepest conviction. And if we do, when our day comes, indeed, we will have no big regrets. Putting our actions in line with our beliefs, Living a life of integrity is a change that is made one choice at a time. And the result is a life I suspect we won't regret. And let us pray. God, we know how this thing we call life works. There was a moment when we were born. There will come a time when we will come home to you. And life is lived in between. Help us to use our lives to make a difference. Help us to live our lives as you would have us do. Help us to live a life that when it comes to a close, we will have no big regrets. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. See, I'm sorry.